Welcome back, everybody. I have the pleasure of introducing our guest speaker today. Uh, Frank Summers is an astrophysicist from the Space Telescope Institute uh, down in Baltimore. He also refers to himself as an astrophysicist, which I think is a very interesting title. And I guess he will uh, tell you more about what he's been up to and what we'll be looking at today. Thank you for coming. All right. Thank you. If you don't mind, I'm not going to use the microphone because I'm louder than the, that's projection system. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some really cool stuff we've been doing over the past, God, it's been almost nine years <coughs> since this project started. Um, and this is the culmination of it this year, okay? It's in various pieces. But working with the Orion Nebula, um, and we're going to explain all sorts of things about multi wavelength learning. This project has been sponsored by NASA's Universe of Learning. Uh, now, this is our new funding stream for outreach through the Science Mission Directorate. Um, it's called NASA's Universe of Learning. You can see it's got Hubble, it's got Spitzer, it's got Chandra, and, and various other people to do a variety of outreach. And the outreach is not mission specific anymore. I'm not paid just to do Hubble. I do Hubble, I do Spitzer, I do Chandra, I do all sorts of things, okay? And it's really the way outreach should be done, um, and thanks to them, we're able to do this. So, we're gonna talk about Orion, okay? And this is a wonderful uh, picture of Orion, but I really love is when you take the H alpha added in, and you get to see all the gas that's in Orion, okay? What makes Orion special is not the stars, but all that beautiful gas. And this yellow blob right here, that's the most special one. That is the Great Nebula in Orion, or Orion Nebula, NGC 1976, if I remember correctly, okay? So this is a ground-based image. This central region in here where the trapezium is, Hubble came up with a really good image back in 1995, um, where you can see the uh, trapezium stars in here. And when you blow that up in detail, not only can you see the honking big stars, but you can also see the tadpoles swimming towards that star. Actually, no, that's not what they are. They are protoplanetary. They are stars in formation where the gas is being blown back by the big bad guy, Theta Orionis 1c, okay? He is the leader of the gang of four of the trapezium, okay? And we have all these proplids all right, as we call them in astronomy, which are stars in formation and the gas around them is being blown back like a windsock. And that makes it really, really cool. It also is cool that we've got these dark dust disks here in the bottom row where you can see the stars turning on inside disks. And in 1995 was the first confirmation that we got as astronomers that this idea that gas collapses into a disk around a forming star really is true. We actually saw it for the first time in this, these Hubble images. The other cool thing is these winds extend across the nebula, and you've got stars like LL Orionis here that have these big bow shocks around them well far away. So it's the <coughs> ionizing radiation and the winds from these massive stars that make Orion special. It's a really cool region. So when we had a chance to work on the IMAX film Hubble 3D uh, in 2000, for 2010, we said, this is a region we really want to explore and go into. So by that time, we had the 2005 image of Orion from Hubble, all right, and we had to process this for making it into a visualization. First thing you gotta do is you want the nebula. So bam, blow away those stars. And I love being able to just hit one click <laughs> and take care of you know, what was 100 hours of Photoshop work. <laughs> but wait a minute, wait a minute. This isn't just the nebula. It's the nebula plus this blue gas here. That's Orion's veil. It's a, a piece of gas that's out. It's been blown out in front of Orion. So we separate out that using some LAB color magic, pull that off, and then fill in. And now we have a view of the Orion nebula. But this is a rectangle. And rectangles don't look good in 3D. So <laughs> we take that and we put it on top of a Robert Gendler image. We match exposures, blend, and fade out, and here we have a uh, Orion Nebula that can float in 3D. But that's just a flat image. We need to sculpt this. So we go in and we figure out all the details of it. We've got the dark bar, we've got the bright bar, we've got the trapezium, a valley here, a valley here, and all this stuff. We work through with the specialists to try and figure out 
an approximate 3D structure for it. Then we take it into our sculpting software um, and we create the model. And this looks pretty much like it does from Earth because you're viewing the model from the front. But if we take the camera down onto the nebula, you can see how we have that low valley here, the high valley here, the dark bar there, and you can see the uh, veil sitting up in front. That veil is, of course, just a piece of geometry with a surface texture put onto it, okay? Um, all right, and we go down and we can see the valley very nicely here. But again, it's also a surface texture. It's a hard surface. Do nebula have hard surfaces? No, they do not. So this is where it gets really expensive, at least <laughs> back in 2009 when we did this. Um, you have this hard surface model, which looks a little bit like a computer game, and you want to turn it into a fuzzy nebula, okay? We worked with the folks at NCSA to try take this, and they have the big supercomputers, so they can do all this, and it took 30,000 CPU hours of rendering time to do this sequence, and you get that nice fuzzy surface on it, and it starts to look like a nebula, okay? And you've got to add back in the stars from the Hillenbrandt catalog, you add back in those proplids and those bow shocks, um, and you get your Orion Nebula, okay? And that's what we did for the IMAX film, Hubble 3D, which was released in, uh, what was it, April of 2010. That's eight years ago. It has made $73 million worldwide, which is damn good for a documentary, okay? <laughs> um, it actually, I looked up on Box Office Mojo this morning, it's number five on the list of movies that never made the top 10. Okay, that were never inside the top 10 of Box Office Mojo uh, for the weeklies and anything. Uh, it's number five on the list in terms of ones that a long standing, still making money eight years later. Okay, so we're happy with this, right? Wrong, we are not happy with this. There are improvements. And what always, always bothered me every time I saw it is that when NCSA created the particles, they created on top of the hard surface model. Look at that hard surface model underneath there. There's no hard surfaces in a nebula. Ugh, I know, it's the best we could do at the time. But can we do better? I wouldn't be here if we couldn't, right? <laughs> um, and the answer is Georges Seurat, all right? <laughs> this is one of Georges Seurat's famous paintings, uh, Sunday at La Grande Jatte. It is one of the most masochistic painting styles you can imagine because he goes in and draws individual little dots across this 10 foot by six foot canvas, okay? 60 square feet of dot, drive you dotty, right? Yeah, all right, it's called pointillism. And I bring it in because that is also the name of my software code that I use to render the Orion Nebula that you're going to see. Um, it is a point-based rendering code. It takes all these millions and millions of points and renders them as little splats with, with different density profiles, okay? Light density profiles to give me uh, ultimate flexibility in being able to represent the nebula. So, this is the NCSA version, and this is the version done in pointillism, okay? I replaced all the points that they had generated and put the ones that I had generated regenerate, create them all the way down. There's no hard surface model in this. It's all points all the way down, okay? Um, so then you can get your beautiful Orion Nebula and you can fly through it in 3D uh, using our code. But is that enough? No, that is not enough, okay? Because there's more than one space telescope out there. I told you that I work with Hubble, okay? But I now also work with Spitzer, okay? And so this is Spitzer's view of the Orion Nebula. And you can see it's a little cut off on the side, so let's add to that the WISE data, which is also in the infrared. Um, and we have another view of Orion, right? And if we cut out Orion in, from the Spitzer and WISE data, then we can have um, IMAX, we can have the Orion Nebula as viewed by Hubble and the Orion Nebula as viewed by Spitzer, and you can see you get two. You get a multi-wavelength view of the nebula. That's what's really cool and what we're doing here today. All right, and so in January of last year, we released a fly-through in 4K um, at the, um, American, at the uh, American Astronomical Society meeting, and it looked like this.
sequence contains a lot of really important points that I made sure, as the astronomer on the project, I made sure there were a lot of really important things in there that you can teach to your audiences. But just watching it, you may not ca caught them all. So my whole rest of my talk is about how to interpret that sequence and how to show off the pieces that we're talking about uh, that, that are presented in a sequence like that. Now, the first part of it is a zoom. And I will admit, we did not actually do this zoom sequence. The zoom sequence was done by the European Space Agency for a totally different project. But they had released the 4K frames out there. Um, and I was able to, with their permission, grab them, pull them into our sequence automatically. So it starts from the full Milky Way, the Giga Galaxy pan sequence. All right, comes through, and you get to see the Orion constellation. Also, they included the H alpha, which is great, so you can see the gas stuff there, um, and then pull down onto the Orion Nebula sequence uh, there. So you get to scale for what, how detailed uh, these Hubble and Spitzer images are. What a small piece of the sky. As you all know, it's really important for the public to understand that you know when they look at the sky, Hubble's really looking at that tiny little piece, and it's hard for them to imagine. And I love this zoom sequence because it puts it into their head. It's like the powers of 10 sequence when you first see that. You go, oh my god, it changes your perspective on things. Well, hopefully this sets the stage for understanding that we're looking just a very tiny piece of the sky here. All right, the second piece um, is the 2D and the 3D comparison. So uh, we no, you'll notice we, we start with the, the ground-based image. We pull out the Hubble view, invisible light, and the uh, Spitzer view in infrared, uh, giving you an immediate notification that, hey, things look totally different in different wavelengths of light. That is a much bigger nebula there. There's a lot more gas um, in there than there is here, right? Wrong. It's, uh, the gas is at a different, t is, is there in both pictures, but it's at a different temperature. Whereas this takes the gas that's thousands of degrees, all right? The infrared captures uh, gas that's at hundreds of degrees, okay? So you're seeing gas at different temperatures. And of course, the cooler gas can extend out to much further away from the heat source, which in both cases is these trapezium stars. The trapezium stars are basically the major stars that are responsible for heating this nebula, um, and of course, in the infrared. Plus, what I love about the infrared is you can see the full bowl of the nebula, okay? Um, a lot of the understanding of nebula can be done by thinking about temperature and pressure, okay? So if we have the high temperature and pressure here, that flows out this direction, pushes away the gas. You can see we almost have some pillar-like stuff here on the right-hand side, okay? You can see the flow, and it fills sort of this bowl shape of the nebula, okay? So you get that understanding when you, you well, I don't know if you get that understanding. You can, you can get that understanding by seeing the infrared. I don't think it's easy as easy to explain. You can sort of see the bowl here, but it's not complete as it is in the infrared. All right? And then we take, that's a 2D comparison. Um, then, oops, I'm sorry. I, I could have gone to this when I was talking about that. Uh, all right, I already talked about that. Next, now we go to the 3D, OK? And so without moving the camera, I show you the 3D model of the, of the visible light version of it, okay, where you get, which sets you up. And then you can see experience in 3D the much larger region of the Orion Nebula of, of, uh, in infrared. So you start to see, see what it looks like on the sky. And then you translation over to the 3D, which sets you up, of course, for the fly-through. All right, in the fly-through, one of the first things we do immediately is we have to go through the veil, okay? And that's a transition point. It's a very significant transition point because once you pass through that veil, you're inside the nebula, okay? So here is a camera shot just inside the, nebula, the, the veil, and you feel like, the, as you, it's sort of like the ceiling that rises above you, and you're inside the nebula and, and feeling. But it's important to know that, again, that same pressure thing is that the gas that was on the front side of that nebula, some of it got pushed away and became this veil. Okay, where some of the gas got eaten out and ionized, et cetera. Some of the gas in the front got pushed away by the pressure and created to have this veil in front. Astronomers use this veil and the knowledge of it to measure the depths of the stars in Orion, okay? So the amount of absorption by interstellar dust type stuff 
uh, between the star and the top of the veil tells you the depth of the star in, inside the nebula. All right? And so it's a very important point to cross scientifically as well. Um, Massimo Roberto, who helped me with uh, some of the uh, placement of the stars, used that uh, in terms of giving me intuition. Now, are these stars exactly placed perfectly? No, okay? We're not going to research where all 780 stars of the uh, Hillenbrandt catalog exactly are. We're not gonna research, I think, the best we can do is more statistical models, but for the most important stars, he came through and helped me make sure that we got it reasonably accurate, okay? All right, I'm not gonna say it's scientifically accurate, I'm gonna say it's reasonably accurate, okay? Uh, so it, gives, it doesn't give off a false impression. But take that same thing and that veil, which I did not think would be there in the infrared, surprised me, smacked me on the head, uh, is actually still there uh, in the infrared, okay? Uh, when we started planning the infrared shot, I was like, oh, well, there won't be a veil, so we don't have to worry about that element. Wrong, okay? We went through <laughs> and analyzed it, and it was still there, okay? So you can still see the veil. Another interesting point um, is Hillenbrandt 860, right there, okay? That star, Hillenbrandt, or is it 866? I can't, I can't remember. You can see it's got a blue fuzzy glow around it, okay? That indicated that it is close to the veil. That blue glow is actually veil gas glowing from Hillenbrandt 860, all right? And so we take that blue glow um, and we make sure we model it, um, and here's the star up here. There's the star, and there's that blue glow from the veil. So that, that blue glow of the veil is there and stays with that star. When you watch it, you'll be able to see it float up. Oh, this, by the way, is a uh, piece from a, an equiangular protection, a, a VR360 one. So it looks kind of warped, especially up at the poles and everything. Okay, that's just because it's a longitude latitude projection, all right? But that's an easy way to see uh, Hillenbrand 860 as well as everything else here. All right? So, next point is the background stars, all right? When we did the Orion Nebula at the American Museum of Natural History in New York, uh, for the grand opening of the, the Rose Center for Earth and Space back in 2000, and we flew into the Orion Nebula, if you looked outside the nebula, there weren't any stars. Whoops, excuse <laughs> me, Sorry, where am I? I accidentally did that. Oh, 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 good. There we go. There weren't any stars outside the nebula, and it really bothered me, okay? Um, it was just something that, that, that didn't get put into the model there. Uh, here we do have the stars. So we have the stars uh, inside the nebula. We also have the stars outside the nebula, all right? <coughs> so what we did is, um, uh, what I'm presuming AM and H did for their remake of this show, uh, is then implant the nebula within the um, Hipparchos catalog. 100,000 stars nearby, so we implant it in, inside it and we just render a background of stars uh, for the whole thing based upon where the Orion Nebula would be within the Hipparchos stars. So that, those are scientifically accurate positions for all those stars relative to the Orion Nebula uh, in Hipparchos. But then when we need those stars in or infrared. So to get them in infrared, we just colored them blue. No, we didn't, actually. Um, to get the star colors in uh, Hipparchos, we actually used the B minus V colors that are in the Hipparchos catalog, but we also had the V minus I colors in the Hipparchos catalog, so we could go from the visible light colors to the infrared magnitudes, and we could adjust the magnitudes. Now they are blue, okay? Why is that? Because in the um, Spitzer data, the only band pass that saw the stars was the, um, was it the four micron? Yeah, I think it was the four micron band pass. It's the only thing that saw the stars, so the stars are blue, okay? This is not trying to represent the stars as they would be seen in a general infrared, but as in the Spitzer band passes that they use, the four micron, the eight micron, and the 20 micron that were used to create that image, okay? So we stayed faithful to the Spitzer color chart um, and that's why all the stars are blue, but their magnitudes are adjusted uh, based upon the actual uh, infrared magnitudes of the stars in the Hipparchos catalog. It actually doesn't make a huge difference. If I blink them back and forth, you'll only see like five or six that really catch your eye. But it was important for me as an astronomer to have that in there. All right, um, then we have the lower valley. Um, this is the lower valley as seen in here. And you can see we've got the trapezium down the bottom of it, and we've got a nice wide valley, okay? It's even wider when you get to the infrared. 
Why? Because infrared is seeing cooler gas at a deeper layer in the nebula, okay? So the entire infrared valley underlies the visible light valley, okay? The hot gas and the cooler gas underneath it. So everything here is deeper and wider and bigger, all right? Then we have the dark and bright bars. And if you don't know what I mean, I'm talking about these things here. Here is the Hubble image of Orion. This is called the dark bar, which is dark gas hanging out over uh, in front of the trapezium area. And then the bright bar, which is this ribbon of bright gas, which is actually the gas. There's a dense wall there. All right, the, scientists, the folks who study Orion tell me there's a dense wall right here where the energy from these stars impacts that wall and makes it shine really, really bright, okay? Um, this is a region that the, even the trapezium stars haven't been able to eat away this region. That's what kind of density they have in this thing, okay? Um, so here in the um, visible light, you can see the uh, bright bar over here and you can see the dark bar there. When we go to the infrared, the bright bar is still there, but there's no dark bar, okay? And it took us a, a while to make sure that, you know, absolutely none of it, uh, we, we stu studied the Spitzer images over and over, make sure, yep, no, that bar is completely gone in the infrared. So when we do that cross fade, you'll notice that the bar just disappears, okay? Uh, in terms of the nebula stars, for the visible light, we use something called the Hillenbrandt catalog, which we had used in IMAX Hubble 3D. Um, but most of the, those are the bright stars, visible light stars. But there are so many faint, small stars that show up in infrared that don't show up in the visible light images. So um, at Space Telescope, uh, Mario Gennaro has a complete catalog of near-infrared stars. It was the best star catalog we could get for Orion. And so this turns into that. Okay, so if I blink back and forth, you can see some of the stars are the same, because of course the hill and ramp stars do shine in the infrared, but there are so many more of the small stars that don't show up in visible light that shine in the infrared that we had to add them in. Uh, in reverse, we have the bow shocks and proplids. Here is our hero proplid. You can see the star that it formed, the disc around it, the jets, and the proplid around it. Okay, that passes right by the camera. We call that's the thing that, that you know, catches your attention as you fly through. You can see all these bow shocks and everything, and they are gone uh, in the infrared. Um, there just isn't the if they are if they do shine in infrared, Spitzer did not have the resolution to see them, so we just <coughs> obliterated them. Uh, did not include them in the infrared uh, infrared model. Then the sequence goes into the upper valley. Um, and in visible light, this is actually pretty boring, okay? Um, there's not much to see here. But in the infrared light, you have interesting differentiation between the red, which is the 20 micron, um, and the green, which is the eight micron gas, okay? And the blue is the four micron where you see the stars, okay? And you can see this modeled structure. And this modeled structure shows up when we get out of that valley and look back. Now, can you see that sort of mountainous region here? All right? It comes, boom, popping out when you see it in the infrared. And notice it has this chevron shape. And there's another chevron shape here. And they're pointing toward what? The trapezium stars. Because the energy from the trapezium stars is blowing out across this upper valley and it's diverging around these like a river delta type configuration, okay? And you can see the gas is coming and flowing here and flowing here. And some of it makes it across the top and flows here and flows here. And you can see the energy distribution from the trapezium in the images when you look for it. It's also there in the visible light images if you know what to look for. I blink back and forth, you can see it, okay? All right. Oops, wrong way, gotta go the other way. Okay, the final thing is that we then wanna take this and put it up on a dome for you guys, okay? Yes, but I work in an office building. I don't have a dome like this. So, what is, what is my solution? My solution is VR 360 movies. Um, and here's an actual live action shot of me looking at uh, one of my visualizations on a planetarium dome, a virtual planetarium dome inside my office. So I can render all this to a VR360 movie, put on the Oculus Rift, and, and, and see somewhat what it's like uh, to see it in a planetarium. You don't get your peripheral vision, which is really bad, 
uh, but at least you get uh, to, to preview it. And when I come here to Spitz or other, other places where they do have domes, I can be reasonably confident that what it's of what it's going to look like. Okay, and only there's there are only small tweaks instead of major tweaks. Okay, all right. So now is the time. Uh, let's play that dome version. Can we kill the projector? Or you know, actually, I could put I could go. Wait a minute. I could go there. No, no, okay, get ready. <laughs> <laughs> can be restarted. Give it a couple um, seconds. Great. Uh, it'll take a while for it to come up. Whoops. It's uh, reconnecting to my... <laughs> All right. When it comes back up, I will show you, make sure you know where you can download these uh, things from. So uh, we have <laughs> produced the 4K version. We have produced a VR360 version that you can watch. Um, and we have, have produced this dome version. You can get the dome version from Spitz, uh, since you guys are Spitz customers. If you want to download the individual frames yourself, all, what, 10, 20 gigabytes or whatever for each sequence, um, you can also get them at Hubble site. Um, on Hubble site, if you click this thing called videos uh, in the science, you can find things like this. Um, uh, for the dome ones, there are actual uh, download links over here that you can download every single frame. Uh, 7,200 frames at 60 frames a second. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of data. And I have to thank, by the way, Spitz for doing an amazing job of transforming them in a very short turnaround time for the MAPS conference. Um, thank you guys so much for that. Um, all right, and the other place you can get our videos, um, if you don't like going to Hubble site, you can also find them on YouTube. We are the Hubble Space Telescope channel. I think it's called Hubble site. Ch yeah, actually, no, they, they, they gave us Hubble Space Telescope, okay? Um, and we have this astronomy visualizations playlist. You can see there are 31 videos, uh, some of them there. The dome ones that are on here are just previews, of course. They're a rectangle, they're a, a 16 by nine with a circle in the center to show you the dome preview. Um, you can get that. All right, and uh, we love giving away our stuff. Please uh, let us know if you use it as extensively that we can, so we can tell all the folks above us who will say, oh, it's worth giving them money to make more of this stuff. Uh, so, you know, we, get, we show them the hits on YouTube and all this other stuff, but it also helps if the planetariums send in a little note to say what they've done, okay? 
Um, and so thank you for your attention. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Okay, why don't you guys do the transition? If you guys have questions, come on up here. I'm happy to answer. Excellent, thank you. And that uh, rendered sequence is going to be on the flash drive that you'll walk out here with. Yay! Oh, and by the way, the dome version is available as visible uh, infrared as you just saw, visible light only, and infrared light only. Okay, so you've got three versions. So if you want to take your audiences through each of them separately and then pull them together in the combined one, um, that's also a very good educational type of thing. You're, you're getting all three. You're getting all three? Whoa! You guys are very good. What resolution?